All right, coming back at you with another exercise application assignment video. This is another time where I'm just a day late on this, so it is what it is. These are getting a little bit tedious because we haven't covered new content, and I feel like I'm saying the same things over and over. But let's cover training today. Training today was legs. Um, so I added, like, two sets just because I felt like... Um, progression was getting a little bit hard to force so I just added another set on leg press and another set on squats we were chilling so I started off with leg press calf raises and then I knocked out a set of leg press and then my second set of leg press was a rest pause set right into air squats to failure um so that was pretty fun. And then I did Smith Machine Squats with an elevated heel. And I was able to match my set that I did last time, which is good. Um, because I added a set on leg press. So really, in theory, my reps on my squat should have gone down, but they didn't. Um, so we're good there. That's the same thing in my mind as doing two more reps. So I still force progression. And then after that, I did Smith Machine Sissy Squats, just one set. And I matched my set last time, which makes sense. Um, and then after that, I did two sets of seated hamstring curls, just like normal. Uh, I lowered the weight a little bit and really focused on keeping my back arched and almost treating it like a stiff legged like deadlift and trying to get a really full stretch of the hamstrings. Still not quite there, not quite able to keep a full stretch while maintaining my posture like this, but I feel like that's just something I have to train over time. And it isn't going to be something that just you know oh lowering the weight is gonna fix you know it's it takes practice so let's run through right quick how does that relate to my training I'm gonna try and cover as much content looking at my notes with this as possible let's run through it all so when i'm weightlifting the pcr uh, the phosphocreatine system is going to be a main source of energy, especially early on, because it's super duper quick, right? We're gonna have phosphocreatine plus ATP, mediated by creatine kinase, converted into creatine and ADP. That's gonna give me energy to perform my exercises. Um, then we have glycolysis. Glycolysis is, <sighs> so yawning so much. I'm tired. Um, <laughs> glycolysis is going to be, you know, taking my glucose. And the first thing we're going to do is have an energy investment with ATP. And it's going to drop off its phosphate group. And that's going to be mediated by the enzyme hexokinase. Hexokinase is going to come in, drop that phosphate group, and then we're going to get G6P. G6P is going to be converted by um, an isomerase. What isomer? Phospho. What is it? It is mm, phosphoglucose isomerase. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Phosphoglucose isomerase. And then um, basically what that's going to do is convert it into fruit, fr change glucose into fructose. So we're going to have F6P now. Then we're going to have our second energy investment come in. ATP dropping off the phosphate group. Um, and the enzyme PFK, phosphofructokinase, and that's what that's going to be mediated by. And then we're going to get uh, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. And then basically aldolase is going to come in and split that into DHAP and G3P. And then triose phosphate isomerase, is that right? Did I get that right? Yes, okay. <laughs> that's the one I'm worried about. Triose phosphate isomerase is going to come and it's going to flip DHAP into G3P. Um, and then basically we're going to shift around uh, phosphate groups a couple of times and we're going to wind up with 2 pyruvate. Um, and in that process we're going to create 4 ATP, but since we invested 2, we get a net of 2 ATP. And so that's happening to a degree when I'm lifting weights. Let's speed it up here. Then we got Krebs cycle. We're going to take those pyruvate, going to run it through Krebs. Basically the pyruvate is going to, NADH is going to act as a, uh, is it a, yes. It's going to act as a cofactor, and we're going to shoot off a CO2. We're going to have acetyl-CoA that's going to combine with oxaloacetate. 
to form a four carbon molecule, molecule, molecule to form citrate. Citrate um, is basically going to go undergo a series of reactions, you know, uh, in order to get to basically break it down and build it back up into oxaloacetate. In that process, you're going to create three NADH and one FADH. So we're going to go through the electron transport chain, three pumps. Um, NADH will run through all three, creating 10 hydrogen in the process and dropping off its electrons at each pump and go through a ATP synthase. Every four hydrogen equals one ATP. Um, FADH is the same, but it starts at the second pump, so it only nets six uh, hydrogen. Um, at the end of that third pump, uh, two hydrogen is pumped out, combines with oxygen and the electrons. Oxygen becomes O2 minus plus O2 minus. O2 becomes O2 minus plus O2 minus, combines with the hydrogen, and then we get metabolic water. Um, so that's happening if I were to do any sort of cardio, which I generally don't. <laughs> um, let's see. Let's think. So then we're talking about. So that's how we create the energy. Now let's talk about nerve pulses because, well, you have to have some sort of, um, you know, signal in order to fire your muscles. So depolarization. Um, you start out your. You have your resting membrane potential, which is about negative seventy millivolts in the nerve cell. Um, and it's going to slowly rise until it hits threshold. And once it hits threshold, which is about negative 55 millivolts, it's going to spike because at that threshold, the sodium gates are going to open. Um, there are, what is it, the, um, the voltage gated, you know, sodium gates are going to open. Sodium is going to flow, it flood in, it floods in at that point. Um, you create your extra potential, and then once it floods in the voltage gated, uh, potassium channels are going to open, potassium is going to flow out due to the concentration gradient, and then we're going to be hyperpolarized for a second there, but then the uh, sodium potassium pumps turn on using ATP to pump out, to pump in to potassium and pump out through sodium. That's going to bring us back to our resting membrane potential um, during our refractory period. Now we use that, once that action potential is going to propagate down, and it is going to um, go to the synaptic input, which is going to push out these vesicles and neurotransmitter, which can send an EPSP, IPSP, or, you know, a no change, keep doing what you're doing type deal. So neurotransmitter is going to bind to ligand gated channels, sodium is going to flood in, depolarize the cell. Um, or move the cell towards hyperpolarization or nothing, you know. Um, but let's say for an EPSP, for example. Uh, so it's going to flood in, and then we have that depolarization signal sent through the cell. And it's going to go through the transverse tubules that are continuous with the sarcolemma. And we're going to activate the dihydropyridine receptors, which in turn activate the rhyanidine receptors of the terminal cisterny of the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum. And then we're going to have a calcium release, calcium binds to troponin on actin. Um, and then tropomyosin shifts the structure of actin so that it exposes the active sites for uh, myosin to bind to, myosin binds. Um, and then inorganic phosphate is released, we have 50% full pool. And then ADP is released, we have a full pool. ATP comes in and that is hydrolyzed by ATP ACE. And then we have ADP and PI bound back to the head. Um, and we also have the detachment of the myosin, and then that cycle repeats, that's cross-bridge cycling. So that obviously happens while I'm training. Um, let's see what else do we have. Lactate threshold, lactate threshold is basically the point at which the build-up of lactate in the muscle starts increasing exponentially. Um, that's because the ATP of um, anaerobic systems is outpacing aerobic systems, and but you know, it's, it's failing, right? Blood lactate increases exponentially. Yeah, hip, yep. Um, what else? Prolonged exercise, more fats. Um, short exercise is gonna be more carbs. I'm using more carbs while I'm exercising for sure um, because my exercise is intense. We have temporal and spatial summation, which is basically akin to um, a firing squad versus, you know, a machine gun. We can send, you know, signals to, you know, the same channels, right? 
um, or we can, you know, send a bunch of signals to a bunch of different channels. We have reflexes, so what is it? You know, a lot of people like to dive bomb their squats. Um, so if you're if you're lifting for Olympic weights, Olympic, Olympic weight lifting, where you squat really deep and you take advantage of the stretch reflex, what's happening is your muscle spindles are stretching, sends a signal to your brain, hey, we're stretching really quickly, so uh, contract so that we don't rip our muscles off our tendons. Um, and so that's what you do out at the bottom of the of an Olympic squat, such as in a uh, clean and jerk or power clean or something. Like that. More so, more so a clean and jerk. Really, I see, you see that a lot. Um, or even in the snatch. Um, that's the stretch reflex. You have the inverse stretch reflex, which is um, stretching a muscle in response to, or like like taking a, telling a muscle to stop firing in response to too much tension, tension on the muscle that's governed by the Golgi tendon organ, which, um, so if you're like trying to squat and it's too much weight and you're pushing, you're pushing, you're shaking, you're shaking, and then you just can't do it, and you, you know, you just fall down, that's the uh, inverse stretch reflex. And you have this idea of reciprocal inhibition, you know, if I have a reflex, the opposite reflex happens in the opposing muscle, so that, uh, you know, like if I have a stretch reflex in my quadriceps, there isn't, you know, a relaxation of the hamstrings, which is known as reciprocal inhibition. You have the size principle, which is progressive recruitment of larger and larger uh, motor units. Um, then let's talk about the muscle. Muscles organized into, what is it? You have the fascia epimyceum, then you have your fascicles um, with your perimyceum, then you have your muscle fibers with your endomyceum, then you have your individual myofibrils, yeah, uh, which we talked about then. Satellite cells are undifferentiated muscle precursor cells. They're for muscle repair and they proliferate and their job is to keep um, the nucleus to, what is it, sarcomere? Cell volume to muscle nucleus ratio. Um, let's see. Type one versus type two fibers. So when you're training, your type two X fibers are gonna become type two A fibers, but they'll never become type one. That was something I misunderstood. Um, so, hey, Dr. Hyde, if you're watching this, I apologize for one of my videos, um, cause evidently I just misunderstood um, what you were saying. But let's be honest here, what you said in, <laughs> what you said in class was that they become uh, more li like, like they become type one. I think you meant to say they become more like type one but that they become type 2A. It was just confusing the way you worded it. And um, uh, I'm glad we got it resolved now. So, I mean, if you're watching this, I forgive you. I forgive you. Um, let's see. Force regulation, faster movements are gonna, you know, be less forceful. In terms of you're not gonna be able to have peak force output at a really fast speed, which makes sense. So then we're talking about biomechanical properties. That's going to be your ATPase activity, your myosin isoforms, um, your abundance of the contractile proteins, contractile properties, maximal force production, speed of contraction, maximum power output. Yeah, we know that. Um, force regulation is governed by the number and types of motor units recruited. Falls the size principle, small motor units first and the big ones. The more motor units recruited, the stronger the contraction, so that helps your force. You need a higher stimulus for a higher force of contraction in order to recruit more motor units. And fast fibers have a greater specific force um, and types also influence the force production, yep. So what is specific force again? I know I wrote it down somewhere. The amount of force uh, generated in a single area, in a single muscle fiber, is the amount of cross bridges making contact with actin. Yeah, which makes sense. So uh, we're, we got 20 more seconds roughly. I think that's really about it. Nature of neurostimulation, initial length of muscle is an optimal length. Um, yeah, I think we're solid. Just another little mini review, trying to run through everything as quick as possible.
Um, that'll do it for this episode. I will see you in the next one.